Hello, my friends. This is Joseph, and welcome to our first edition of Markets Weekly. We have a lot to talk about. So what we're going to talk about today is first, we're going to talk about what's going on with the Fed's balance sheet. Many of you have noticed that it seems like this line item on the Fed's balance sheet spiked tremendously. We're going to talk about what that means. And of course, we're going to talk about what went on with the markets this weekend. There were big, big changes happening in Switzerland. Then we're going to talk about my outlook for the Fed and for markets this coming week. And of course, we're going to talk about what the uh, emergency FX swap lines mean. Okay, so let's start first with what happened with the Fed's balance sheet. So every week, the Fed releases uh, a disclosure of what's on their balance sheet. This is called the H4. Now, what I'm showing on the screen here is the is the loans that the Fed makes. And you'll notice that, you know, during the great financial crisis in 2008, that number surged to over $400 billion. It's been pretty calm since then, spiked up a bit around COVID. And then this, just this past week, it spiked up to, let's see, ah, $300 billion. So it's quite a big number. And let's unpack that. So remember, if you've been following me, then you understand that um, a bank basically borrows money from people and it has short dated liabilities and it has longer dated assets. So one of the big problems a bank faces is what if everyone asks for their money back at the same time? If everyone asks for their money back at the same time, a bank, well, it has, let's say, mortgage loans, corporate loans and so forth. It, those are probably money good, but it might not have enough cash on hand to meet a sudden surge in withdrawals. And when that happens, it goes and asks for a loan from the Fed. The Fed is its lender of last resort. So what a commercial bank would do then is it would take some of its assets, say its mortgages, and pledge it as collateral with the Fed and take out a discount window loan and use that cash to meet withdrawals. So let's look a little bit more in detail about the of the uh, this week's H41 we see here. Okay, so this is the H41 that I'm showing right now. It's on the Fed's website. And as we go down the line items here, this is what I want to show you. So here, loans, primary credit here. This is the discount window loan. And as you can see, it surged tremendously to uh, $152 billion Wednesday end of day. Uh, that's, a, that's a big difference. Okay, so that's one reason why it... The, uh, the number surged. That's a lot of banks, probably um, Silicon Valley Bank, probably First Republic and banks like that. They are experiencing tremendous amounts of their depositors asking for their money back. And they don't have enough cash at the vaults. Of course, how much cash do they keep at the vaults? When I was reading the news, it seemed like, uh, you know, for Silicon Valley Bank, for example, uh, on the day of their closure, they had $40 billion in uh, withdrawal requests. And they only had total assets of $210 billion. So that was a lot of money uh, that they needed, a lot of cash that they needed to come up with. One of the ways they could have come up with it is by getting an emergency loan from the Fed. Uh, we don't know if it's them or not. The Fed discloses who borrows from the discount window with a two-year lag. So we'll know in two years. But it's a good bet. It's probably... Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic as well. And the other part we want to look at is this other credit extensions. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Um, the other credit extensions by by the footnotes here in footnote seven and talking with uh, talking with people like Rishi who you should follow on Twitter who is a good rate strategist. Now it seems to suggest that um, a bank, perhaps Silicon Valley Bank and we don't know but I suspect it is, uh, they had an overdraft with the Federal Reserve. So a bank has a bank has a checking account at the Fed. It's their reserve account. And just like you and me, when we take too much money out of our checking account, we get an overdraft. And in the same way, if a bank uh, withdrew too much money out of their Fed account, they get an overdraft. Okay, now what happens if you get an overdraft and then you get closed down? which is probably what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Remember, uh, they closed down in the middle of the day, 
by the FDIC. So at that time, what could have happened is that they had a huge overdraft at the Fed trying to um, make all their payments, meet all their withdrawals, and then the FDIC came in and shut them down. And at the end of the day, um, they still owed that much to the Fed. Now, this footnote here, footnote 7, shows that, um, okay, it says that includes loans that were extended to depository institutions, so banks, established by the FDIC. The Federal Reserve Bank's loans to these banks are secured by collateral and the FDIC provides repayment guarantees. So that suggests that the FDIC is involved in some way and the easiest way, uh, easiest situation that we could see that is if a bank had an overdraft with the Fed and the FDIC came and closed them down and guaranteed those loans that, uh, that the Fed have outstanding to the bank. So that's what happened with the emergency loans. And it, and it again reflects the, the situation with the regional banks. Now I've discussed this many times, but the regional banks are just not very important to the, great, to the overall banking system in the US. Silicon Valley Bank, you know, less than one tenth the size of JP Morgan and just not very financially interconnected. It's gonna have an impact for the industry that it serves, tech, but it doesn't really have, in my view, any major financial implications. Um, now, many people are looking at the Fed expanding their balance sheet, which, which they do when they make emergency loans, um, as perhaps some kind of easing. Now, let me assure you, uh, when you make an emergency loan in the discount window, that's not easing. Now, when the Fed expands its balance sheet during quantitative easing, it's going out and it's purchasing securities. It's adding excess liquidity in the system. Okay, I can understand if you add excess cash into the system that maybe someone somewhere would take that cash and buy some assets. Perhaps that would be um, maybe asset risk positive. It has been in the past, but this is a totally different situation. This is a bank who desperately needs cash. So desperately needs cash so much that they went out and bought from the Fed. It's not excess cash in the system. It's some part of the system not getting enough cash. It's a sign of significant stress and ultimately led in the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and a significant run on some related banks. So this is not a good sign in the financial system. But it's very likely that we see most of this reverse next week. So. When, you, when people panic, of course, they take all their money out and they run. But since then, we've had one, um, the government come out and basically guarantee all the deposits of Silicon Valley Bank. So if you are someone banking with First Republic or another regional bank and you see that so the government guaranteed all the deposits in Silicon Valley Bank, you have less of a reason to run. And if that's not enough, we have, of course, the always popular Mr. Warren Buffett here, um, potentially, potentially coming out and uh, saving the day. So for those of you who aren't familiar, so Warren Buffett controls, controls Berkshire Hathaway, which is a very successful investment firm that has a lot of money. Warren Buffett has a history of bailing out the banks at, of course, um, very terms that are very favorable to himself. During the great financial crisis in 2008, Warren Buffett made emergency loans to Goldman Sachs and actually at the end of the day did very well for himself. But more importantly, so what we're seeing right now after the failure of Silicon Valley Bank, which if you watched my previous video was a badly managed bank, we're seeing that there's some degree of contagion in banks that were similar to it, uh, like First Republic, which is not as badly managed as Silicon Valley Bank from what I see. But people don't know that because they don't know what's on the books of Silicon Va of First Republic and they don't know what kind of liability management First Republic has. So ultimately, you can think of it as a crisis of confidence. And there are a couple ways that people usually take care of these crises of confidence. The first, of course, is for the government to step in and guarantee all the deposits and so forth. Um, they can't, the government can't really do that because that requires an act of Congress. Another way is to have the private sector step up. 
And there's actually a history of the private sector doing this. Uh, in the early 1900s, there was a big banking panic in the US. And back then, they did not even have a Federal Reserve. So there was no lender of last resort. Back then, at the time, JP Morgan, like the original JP Morgan, got together and basically uh, formed a consortium to bail out the, the failing banks and um, stabilized confidence in the banking sector. This time around, we heard on Friday that something similar uh, was taking place. A group of 30 large US banks deposited $30 billion into First Republic. That's the US banking sector getting together, probably with the strong encouragement of the, of the White House, to go and try to instill confidence in the regional banking sector so that people will not withdraw their money and run away. Now, once panic subsides, things can get back to normal. Fundamentally, um, there is some reason to think that this is just a liquidity crisis. That is to say that uh, First Republic is an okay bank. It just doesn't have enough cash at the moment to meet all the withdrawals. Its assets, fundamentally, from what I gather, seem to be okay. Now, if that's not enough to stem the banking panic in the regional banks, the next step, of course, is to get bigger guns in. And Warren Buffett would be, would be, would be someone who could help. So it seems the new slow over the past weekend is that the White House is trying to get Warren Buffett to come and to help out and um, maybe take, put some money into the regional banks, maybe take a stake in it to try to shore up confidence. Um, there was a possibility that maybe Warren Buffett can, you know, have a deal come through and buy market open Sunday night, everything's okay. It looks like that's not happening. Does it mean it won't happen in the future? It could be that maybe the deal is not good enough for Mr. Buffett. Maybe the banks are not desperate enough. But we'll see because the situation is very fluid. We can open the markets on Monday and everything could be fine. Now, the real big story of the weekend was the fall of a systemically important bank. Now, the failure of Silicon Valley Bank or even other regional banks really don't matter to the global financial system. But the failure of a too big to fail bank, specifically Credit Suisse, that matters a lot. So a major investment bank like Credit Suisse is interconnected with people all throughout the world. So if Credit Suisse were to fail, then people who had investments with Credit Suisse, they might worry that they might you know, lose all their money and they might panic and sell. Or if they actually lost money, maybe the people who they borrowed from would panic that, hey, this, this guy I let money to, he lost money with Credit Suisse. Maybe, maybe that means that uh, he has some solvency problems and maybe that means that I might not get my money back. These kind of daisy chain interconnectedness is something that uh, brought down the financial system during the great financial crises when Lehman failed. So the failure of Credit Suisse is, is definitely a very big deal. Now, I'm not as familiar with what happens in the European banking system, so I can't offer too much insight there. But from what I see from Credit Suisse, it looks like if you can see from this stock chart here, Credit Suisse is a bank that was having a hard time. Uh, you can see here that over the past year, its stock was basically bleeding and bleeding and bleeding to uh, $2 at, at last. And let's zoom out a little bit. Here's Credit Suisse flying high during the heydays in 2007, right before the great financial crisis, stock trading as high as $75. And it just kind of slowly bled out. So. It seemed to be a troubled bank that was always very fragile. And today was a day that they basically snapped. Now, maybe someone else can tell you more detail as to what exa why exactly they, they did such a bad job. But the thing about these too big to fail banks is that they are too big to fail. The Fed let Lehman Brothers fail in 2008 and everyone saw that was a really bad idea. And so the policymakers who grew up fighting the great financial crises know that this is something that you should never, ever do. And uh, true to their lesson, they bailed out Credit Suisse this weekend. Well, not so much bailed out as in 
basically forced a shotgun marriage between Credit Suisse and UBS. So Credit Suisse was basically going to fail and the Swiss government fit, forced UBS to buy Credit Suisse, but offered a whole bunch of sweeteners. Uh, they gave a huge line of, uh, let's say, liquidity backstop, and they also forced some losses on some of the uh, bondholders of Credit Suisse. But at the end of the day, the UBS was willing to buy Credit Suisse for, the, for a total cost of $2 billion, which, uh, as you can see, is much less than their most recent market cap. And uh, that's kind of surprising because Credit Suisse is, for a long time, a, a investment bank with a very long reputation and most of the time a pretty good reputation and now they're no more. That, in theory, is, is um, actually a fairly significant market moving event, but it's also something that shows that the official sector is really willing to do whatever it takes to support the markets. And true to that, at Sunday Open today, what we see is that the stock market is responding favorably. If you look across the asset markets, you have equities up, you have the dollar, okay, USD JPY. Um, so the dollar is strengthening against the yen, which is usually risk on, and some stability in the euro and uh, pound crosses. So, you know, all in all, Okay, one more thing. The yields are rising, of course. So all in all, that suggests that the market took this to be a fairly positive news, and it should. So the failure of Credit Suisse, however remote on Friday, was a very, very troubling prospect. Now that's been taken off uh, completely. Now the regulators came and they took that off. Now there's one more thing that I want to mention, and that is um, the existence of what we hear, okay, this announcement of the coordinated swap lines of US dollar liquidity. So in conjunction with the bailout of Credit Suisse or the merger of Credit Suisse or acquisition, depending on who you ask, there's this, there's this announcement of coordinated US dollar swap lines with a number of central banks throughout the world. Now, these are serious, th these are the big guns. And the Fed does this um, whenever it feels like something big might be happening in the markets. Now, let me explain what a US dollar swap line is. A US dollar swap line is a way for the Fed to basically act as lender of last resort to uh, foreign banks outside of the US. And if you follow my course, uh, Markets 101, I also go into this. So if you are a foreign bank, let's say in Europe, oftentimes, you have um, dollar loans and dollar deposits. If someone, let's say you're a French bank, or let's say actually you're, you're a Swiss bank, and you have a whole bunch of people who deposited dollars with you. Now, if all those people take their dollars out at the same time, well, you're kind of in a pickle because you're, you're a foreign bank in Switzerland and you have emergency lending from the Swiss National Bank, but the Swiss National Bank can't print dollars. They print Swiss franc. So you could theoretically be in a position where everyone asks for their dollars back and you're not able to meet those withdrawals. And perhaps you default, perhaps that causes lots of panic. The FX swap lines are a way for the Fed to act as lender of last resort for dollars to these foreign banks even though they are, you know, outside of the US. The way that this works is that the Fed makes a dollar loan to the Swiss National Bank and the Swiss National Bank then takes those dollars and lends them to the Swiss bank. Now, the Fed always has these swap lines here. It's a, it's a normal thing. What they're announcing today is that they're increasing the frequency from offering them uh, once a week to offering them every day. It's a way for the Fed to make sure that, you know, whatever happens with this Credit Suisse UBS thing, that they're ready, that there's no fallout. So the way that you look at stress in the global dollar system is you look at something called the FX swap basis. When the basis widens, that signifies stress in the global dollar system. Heading into Friday, 
It was a little wider, but you know, nowhere near emergencies. So this actually was not necessarily the way that when the Fed does coordinated uh, U.S. dollar liquidity swap plans like here, they usually do it in times of crises, like during COVID, during the European debt crises, during the Great Financial Crisis, something like this. It's very preemptive, and I think it shows some significant concern the Fed has, maybe significant risk aversion. To be clear, things haven't really gone their way over the past few months. So they had um, a regional bank fail. It looks like there may have been some supervision over, uh, so bad supervision. And it looks like inflation is speeding back up, even though they thought it was transitory. So I'm getting the sense that, you know, they, they're, they're a bit nervous and they're trying to be a bit more um, pro proactive to this. So that brings us to what's happening going forward this week. Now, this week is a big week because we have a Fed meeting and not just any Fed meeting. It's a March meeting. So that means we'll get new dot plot projections. The dot plot is how the Fed communicates its expectation of where policy would be over the next year. Now, it's a really interesting meeting because usually the Fed doesn't like to surprise the markets, so they communicate very clearly what they think they'll, uh, what they will do. Um, last meeting, we, t we discussed the Fed guiding towards 25 basis point hikes for the next few meetings. That was very clear. And then Jay Powell saw inflation reaccelerate, and then he went to Congress and he basically guided towards a 50 basis point hike uh, on the next meeting. And then we had all this excitement in the past week and the market isn't sure. Is, it, is the Fed going to pause or are they going to do 25? And that's an unusual place, to, unusual place to be because you would expect the Fed to be very clear. Now, my best guess is that the Fed actually doesn't know themselves because on the one hand, uh, you have turmoil in the markets that seems to be contained. And it's not just to this, the stuff in Euro, Euroland that seems to be contained. The regional bank crisis here seems to be stabilizing. And after all, the Fed rolled out this brand new bank lending facility to help out. So it seems like things might be okay, but they don't really know. So my best guess right now is that depending on how the market is the next couple of days, they can do 25 or they can pause. Uh, gun to my head, I think 25 is still most reasonable, but I, I'm not really uh, super committed to that. We'll see how trading goes in the next couple of weeks. If the Fed just uh, if the Fed pauses, obviously that's quite positive for risk assets. Many many people in the markets will begin to believe that you know hiking cycles over, got a price and rate cut, rate cuts, and I think risk assets would do very well. Uh, Actually, I think if the Fed hikes 25 basis points, many people will also believe that this is the last hike, rate, rate cuts are imminent, and, uh, and feel that th everything is okay. And it's possible that they may be right, but overall, I think that the underlying uh, inflationary pressures in the markets, uh, no, in the real economy, are still persistent. Uh, we have, for example, continued uh, strong employment, strong wage gains, and as the market believes that the Fed is going to cut rates soon, we could have mortgage rates come down. We can have borrowing rates across across uh, any segment come down. And you know what? That could that could re-stimulate the economy, and maybe it could make let's say the housing come back uh, come back to uh, higher prices, stimulate uh, anything that's interest rate sensitive, and that could, that can of course put inflation back uh, front and center. Um, but so that's what we're okay. And the next thing that we should really focus on is the dot plots and how Chair Powell characterizes his view on the monetary policy. He could easily pause or hike 25 basis points, but also give further guidance as to what he thinks uh, things would be. He could guide towards a more hawkish stance or he could guide towards a more dovish stance. So that that's actually think what I think I would be watching for this week. Um, well, as you can see, um, I think it's kind of going to be a pretty interesting time. So I'm going to watch the FOMC press conference and I'll meet you guys back here and we'll talk about uh, what I think with the routine FOMC debrief. Uh, this went longer than I expected, but I hope it was helpful. Thanks so much for tuning in.